Hello and welcome to lecture number two of a series called To Be or Not To Be, which is a part of a crash course for the upcoming Mains 2022 exam covering GS Paper 4, which is Ethics, Integrity and Aptitude. Let's understand what parts of the syllabus are we going to cover in this particular lecture. The specific parts of the formal syllabus that we're going to cover is number one, <clears throat> human values, lessons from the lives and teachings of great leaders, reformers and administrators. Now, as you would notice, I have used different font colors to denote this particular part of the syllabus. And there are some reasons as to why. Number one, lessons from the lives and teachings of great leaders, reformers and administrators would be better done as a part of a larger theme called contributions of philosophers of the world towards moral philosophy and you would be able to understand them in a structured format. Specific examples could be used to understand human values which we will anyways do in the course of this lecture. When we look at the word human values, <clears throat> what do we understand? We understand that there are essentially from the view of the civil services exam there are human values which every human being should have and there are values which civil servants should have now how does the UPSC look at this the UPSC will ask you about human values in a general contemporary context in the age of the internet social values economic values, cultural values, traditional values. The syllabus does not define or mention any specific value as such when it comes to the generality of it. But when we look at the second syllabus that we've picked up and merged in the second lecture, the second part of the syllabus says foundational values for civil services and it identifies a certain set of values integrity, impartiality and non-partisanship, objectivity, dedication to public service, empathy, tolerance and compassion towards the weaker sections. Now, the UPSC very specifically identifies these as the foundational values for a good civil servant. Through our PYQ analysis, which will follow shortly after this segment, you will understand some of these values such as integrity, objectivity, to a large extent empathy are important not only for civil servants but also for human beings as well. But specific values such as dedication to public service is more suited to, have, to be a value that a civil servant must, ha must have. So when the UPSC asks questions, it sometimes may ask you why is integrity important for human beings and why is integrity important for civil servants. But if the UPSC is asking you dedication to public service, it will only be in the context of civil services. So therefore, when we club these two portions of the syllabus in the second lecture, this is what we're going to cover. Social, economic, political, justice related values, personal values, professional values and values for civil servants. Now, <clears throat> based on the kind of questions the UPSC has asked, human values are asked in the context of application. For example, in the advent of internet, how, has value, how have values changed? So this is actually a larger discussion on internet ethics, on market ethics, not specifically on values. So those discussions will follow in the third lecture when we discuss the dimensions to ethics. International ethics, bioethics, internet ethics, data ethics, uh, corporate ethics, uh, military ethics, and so on and so forth. 
Now that we understand what exactly is it that we're going to study, let us correlate it with the past year papers. This is extremely important. And we will do this in a chronological fashion to understand how the UPSC has evolved in terms of asking those kind of questions. So in 2013, you will see a question which says, some people feel that values keep changing with time and situation, while others strongly believe that there are certain universal and eternal values. Give your perception in this regard with due justification. Now, this question in terms of structure could be answered simply through the variable approach which I have discussed in a separate video on answer writing for the mains exam, which you are more than welcome to watch and I strongly urge that you do, wherein I have broadly explained to you how most mains questions have two to three variables and it's usually the impact of one variable over the other, wherein you can make your subheadings or your permutations accordingly. Now, if you look at this question, it is basically saying that there are a bunch of people, there is a certain section of population which says what is right and wrong is always right and wrong no matter what time period we live in and it is right and wrong for everybody no matter who they are. And there is another section of people which say that what is right and wrong changes with the era that we live in and is not the same for everybody. If you look at it rather simply, this is a question on moral subjectivity. They have just rephrased the question and used values instead of moral subjectivity. And that's how the question could be answered, right? So your larger answer on moral subjectivism or moral subjectivity is the answer to this question. It's just that you have to replace that with certain values. So this could actually largely be studied with the element of dimensions to ethics. So when we apply ethics to sectors, to society, to the world at large, we begin with the assumption that there are a few things which are universal, which are eternal, and depending on context, do they or do they not change? So this is something that we would be able to answer better in the third lecture. Look at the next question from 2014. The current society is plagued with widespread trust deficit. What are the consequences of this situation for personal well-being and societal well-being? What can you do at the personal level to be or to make yourself more trustworthy? Now, the operative part of the question is, and always remember, the longer the question, the structure is always embedded in the question. So you could define what is trustworthiness and what is trust and what is a trust deficit. You could then explain the consequences of it and then you can explain the measures in which an individual can be trustworthy. Now if you notice, the word trustworthy is very similar, if not very closely congruous, to the word integrity. Because if a person has integrity, a person will necessarily be trustworthy or will at least have some element of being trustworthy. If not, it is very close to the word honesty, which is also fairly similar to integrity. So even if the UPSC doesn't mention the word trustworthy, it is asking you about a value which is very close to an already defined value called integrity. So the point that I'm really trying to make here is the larger arguments that you would have for integrity or honesty would also be applicable to a person being trustworthy. So you don't have to sweat too much about a random word that has come out of nowhere and be taken aback and lose your confidence while you're writing the exam. Look for the closest word that you know and write an answer accordingly. You will still fetch extraordinary marks. But this is again a question which has been asked beyond the context of civil services. This question has been asked for a value which the syllabus identifies as a civil service value but is actually a value which is applicable whether or not a person is a civil servant. 
Let's look at the next question. In the context of defense services, patriotism demands readiness to even lay down one's life in protecting the nation. According to you, this is very, very important. According to you, what does patriotism imply in everyday civic life? Explain with illustrations and justify your answer. Now the question is, <clears throat> again, funnily enough, the question has been asked in an election year, so of course, has a certain amount of weightage on that front. But the question is, for the army, the patriotism may mean, uh, the, the, the idea or the element of patriotism would mean uh, laying down one's life for the country. But for you and me as ordinary citizens, how can you and I be patriotic? Now, in a question like this, you can also explain how patriotism in the Indian Army or in the armed forces or in the defense is not just about laying down your life for the country, but is also ensuring that you don't do anything which compromises the unity, the integrity of the country, the security of the country. So you can add another dimension to the question. And then you can ask, answer the question what it is really all about. And while I understand that this question might again seem a little difficult, but if you think about it, the answer is right there in front of you. All you have to do is quote a few fundamental duties, substantiate with a few examples, applying fundamental duties to daily life, and that is how you would be patriotic. The premise that I'm trying to build here is, if every citizen in India effectively abides by and implements the fundamental duties in their lives, will they not be patriotic? They will be more patriotic than anybody else in the country. So that is something that we must stand for. Then comes the 2015 question. Social values are more important than economic values. Discuss the above statement with examples in the context of the inclusive growth of a nation. Now, while this question again might seem technical and you might think of certain values, what this question is really justifying or is asking you to justify is the Indian model of socialism. Is the Indian model of democratic, welfareist, socialist economy. So your social values such as welfareism, inclusion, progressive taxation, protection of vulnerable sections, this could translate into very tangible examples such as state ownership of key industries, direct benefits transfer, food security, state-sponsored healthcare, state-sponsored education, heavy investment in key infrastructure. These are all values, implications of values. And what are your market values? What are your economic values? Competition, free market, the lack of a safety net. So why are these better than these is your larger answer on why is India a socialist country. Because if India is a socialist country, then we value social values more than economic values. So all I'm asking you to develop is an ability to sit back and, and get away from the question and think as to what is the question really asking you. Because there are very high chances that what the question is asking you is something you've already studied in general studies. It's just asking the same from a different perspective. Then in 2020 is a question that elderly people in the country often ask each other over a bonfire in a hill station. The current internet expansion has instilled a different set of cultural values which are in conflict with traditional values. Discuss. Now this is a question which is more about the dimensions of ethics. It is about the impact of technology in ethical values, on ethical values. So the operative word is current internet expansion has therefore changed what our cultural values were and those, those changes are contradicting what our traditional values were. 
So if you actually break down this question, you would, so you would say x were our original cultural values, y are our cultural values because of internet and therefore y is contradicting with z if you think so and z are your traditional values. So if you identify the variables in a question, you would be able to answer the question more effectively with adequate examples of course. And then in 2021, integrity is a value that empowers the human being. Justify with a suitable illustration. Now if you see, integrity in your syllabus is categorically mentioned as a foundational value for civil servants. But integrity in 2021 has been asked in terms of how important is it for a human being to have that value. Which means the common values which are foundational to civil services and are also applicable to betterment of human life must be studied in that perspective. So whether it's integrity or empathy, whether you're a civil servant or not, we should all have a degree of integrity, we should all have a degree of empathy. As opposed to that, all of us need not have a dedication to public service. For example, if there is somebody who is a hardline business person, as long as the hardline business person is doing their job well, ensuring that the workers at the business are taken care of, is in compliance with the laws and is doing the business ethically, that business person may still need to have integrity but does not need to have dedication towards public service. And that is why some of these values have to be studied. Now, these are the questions that have been asked in terms of everybody, you and me. It does not necessarily matter if you and I are civil servants or not. But when we look at the next set of questions that have been asked, those are the questions that have been asked specifically in the context of the civil services. So before we move to them, if we see the kind of progression UPSC has made from 2013 to 2021, you will see that the questions are becoming more argumentative and more opinion based in, in nature. The first few questions, because the paper was also new in 2013, were directly verbatim taken from the syllabus or the most basic implications of it. But the sooner you come to 2021, the closer you come to 2021, you will see questions which are more discussion based in nature. Now, once we understand this, we look at the questions that have been asked specifically on civil service values. Let's begin right from the bottom to understand the evolution. In 2013, the UPSC asked, what do you understand by the following terms in the context of public service? Now, a common mistake that most people do is, and, and take this mistake very seriously, public service and civil service is not the same thing. Civil service is a type of public service. A person who is an elected representative is also a public servant. A minister is also a public servant. A judge is also a public servant. So public services is a larger umbrella term. And whenever questions on public service are asked, you must try and examine L, E and J. Legislators, executives and the judiciary. Because largely students focus only on the permanent executive because they often think public servant and civil servant is the same thing. In the same way, just to draw a parallel, whenever there is a question asked on local self-government, most students only focus their answers on rural local self-government and ignore the challenges and, and the propensities to change in urban local self-government. Unless the question specifically asks for Panchayati Raj, local self-government means rural and urban. 
means panchayati and municipalities. So public service also means the three. So even if you write one one example or one one way for each of the public services, you will always get more marks than somebody who just writes about civil service as an ingredient of public service. Now, look at the five terms. Integrity, handpicked from the syllabus. Perseverance, not categorically mentioned as a foundational value, but very similar to dedication to public service. If you are perseverant enough, that makes you a dedicated civil servant. So even if it's a word close enough, the larger arguments would still apply. Spirit of service, again, dedication to public service. Commitment, again, dedication to public service. Courage of conviction, objectivity, impartiality and non-partisanship. Personal opinion, objectivity, impartiality and non-partisanship. So you just have to write a few lines for each. You've got five terms and three marks each. So if you've got to write three, you've got to write for integrity in three marks, you define it, give three examples or three interpretations for L, E and J because all of the three are public services and you're done. Like for example, a judge cannot have a personal opinion or a personal bias determine the outcome of the judgment, right? So things like that. So integrity becomes your favorite word. Come to the next question. Integrity without knowledge is weak and useless. But knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful. What do you understand by the statement? Explain your stand with illustrations from the modern context. Now, if you think about it carefully, it does not categorically mention public service. This means while integrity is a core civil service value, like in the previous set of questions, this question has also been asked in the context of the general human beings. And this is nothing but breaking it down into specific permutations and combinations. First, explain why integrity without knowledge is weak and useless because this becomes an issue of competency and uh, caliber and knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful is essentially an issue of of abuse of power right so for example developing a nuclear bomb is knowledge without integrity integrity without knowledge will essentially make you not have the capacity to defend yourself against external threats so you can give ad adequate examples and I'll give you a set of those. And that is how the answer has to be made. Several such examples from different contexts. You will see another word. How do the virtues of trustworthiness and fortitude get manifested in civil service? Explain with examples. A lot of people while answering this question ignored the word manifested the question isn't why are these two important the question is how do you develop them or how do they get developed as a career in the public service progresses again it is public service it is not civil service trustworthiness as we've discussed before is fairly close to integrity and fortitude is essentially doing the right thing in in the face of courage in the face of adversity which is fairly close to objectivity so your background words are integrity and objectivity and you could use those arguments here also and write a substantially decent answer let's come to the next question why should impartiality and non-partisanship be considered as a foundational value in public service, especially in the present day socio-political context. Now, 60% of this question should be in the context and 40% should be beyond the context because it says specially, it does not say only. Now, 
why should civil servants be ethical? The same arguments could be applied to why should they be impartial or why should they be non-partisan, right? So again, the question here is public service, which is how you'll be able to develop the diversity of points, right? These are direct words from the syllabus and of course, I'll give you uh, answers to these. One of the tests of integrity is complete refusal to be compromised. Explain with reference to a real life example. Now, you could give the example from civil services, from any public service, from any other walk of life. That is okay. Would be better if you give an example from within the government because integrity is mostly tested in that context but it should be a real life example and not a hypothetical one. So of course, this is again, integrity has been asked. As you can see, integrity has already been asked three times in the last, say, four years till 2017. Examine the relevance of the following in the context of civil service. Transparency, accountability, <clears throat> fairness and justice, courage of conviction and spirit of service. You will see there is, there is a degree of repetition here. Spirit of service was also asked in 2013. Here it said courage of conviction, right, which was also asked here again in 2013. So you can see that at least 25% of the question from 2013 was repeated again in 2017 and here it specifically mentions civil service while here it mentioned public service. Now transparency and accountability are largely notions that we study in the context of governance as a whole. How do we make the institutions, the system, the people, the laws, all of them as a whole the 360 degree view on policy formulation, implementation and valuation, more transparent and accountable and therefore more responsible. You can take up just the element from there and answer the question here. Now, if you notice, transparency is an ingredient of integrity. So is accountability. Fairness and justice is also an ingredient of objectivity. If you are not objective or impartial, you will not be able to be fair or just. Courage of conviction is again objectivity and spirit of service is dedication to public service. The point I'm trying to make here is, even if the word is not directly mentioned in your syllabus, it correlates to a word which is. So you could use half the arguments of argument of, of, of objectivity in transparency, half in accountability, uh, half of objectivity in, in, in fairness and justice and so on and so forth. Now, state the three basic values, universal in nature, in the context of civil services and bring out their importance. This is the UPSC handing the question out to you decorated in on a platter. Out of the foundational values that have been listed, pick any three that, you're, that you think are important, the ones that you think you've prepared the best and answer those. Another question, not specifically in the context of civil services, but uses the foundational value. In looking for people to hire, Look for three qualities, integrity, intelligence, and energy. If they don't have the first, the other two will kill you, is a quote by Warren Buffett. What do you understand by this statement in the present day scenario? This is, of course, in the context of several business scams, bank scams, several corporate disorders that have happened in the country and you can use those examples across the board, right? Now, this question again has nothing to do with civil services or public services, 
but one of the values pertains as a foundational value. The other two questions which were asked in the same year are fairly interesting. Identify five ethical traits on which you can plot the performance of a civil servant and justify their inclusion in the matrix. So identify the traits and explain why they are an important trait and how you can sort of judge the performance of a civil servant. Most people thought they, they were similar questions. Identify 10 essential values that are needed to be an effective public servant. Describe the ways and means to prevent non-ethical behavior in public servants, which is nothing but your answer on how to combat corruption. So you have to do this legislatively, you have to do this uh, through rules, through better institutions, agencies, a change of demeanor, a change of, of, of outlook, a change of the way we perceive public service to be in the country. But this is public service and this is a civil servant. Two very different things, one might be a part of the other and so on and so forth. Now in 2021. Besides domain knowledge, a public official needs innovativeness and creativity of a high order as well. While resolving ethical dilemmas, discuss with a suitable example. If you have practiced enough case studies, the middle ground solution to case studies is the answer to this question, right? That's usually what we recommend. That's usually what we do. We try to figure out an innovative way to solve the ethical problem in a case study in which the problem gets solved and the answer is not too extreme in its nature. But look at the question. Domain knowledge, innovation and creativity are sort of sub values of dedication to public service that you're improving yourself, you're dedicated to public service, you want to be a better civil servant, so, so, so you will learn more, you will figure out ways of innovation, you will try to be creative and not just do what the job asks you to do, you will do what the job needs you to do, right? Then the last question, should impartiality and non being non-partisan be considered indispensable qualities to make a civil servant? Now, I'm sure a lot of you would be thinking, isn't this too obvious? The answer has to be yes. But there would also be reasons as to why sometimes being impartial or being non-partisan might not necessarily be in the interest of the civil servant. For example, the civil servants, and remember, there's a reason why they say civil servants here and not public servants. Because public servants by nature may not necessarily be impartial. An MP cannot be impartial. An MP would be loyal to the political party which has backed the MP to become an MP. But for example, if you are a collector in a district and the political party which has the ruling, which is the ruling party and, you, and the government is from the political party is asking you to implement a specific scheme over an older scheme of an older political party, you would want to do this over this because you're supposed to be working under the broader directions of your political masters. So sometimes a civil servant may not necessarily be absolutely impartial. But again, direct words from the syllabus. So what do we understand from here? We'll pick up the main words, we'll do a 360 degree analysis, we'll understand what the closest correlative words are and then we will study this in further amount of detail. Now, if these were the questions and these questions had some values given all over the place, if I had to extract these values these are the values that have been asked so far. The ones that I have outlined using the color blue 
using the color yellow sorry are the ones which have been specifically asked only and only in the context of civil services but the values that i have mentioned in both the colors white and yellow integrity domain knowledge have been asked in the context of civil services or public services and in general as well as we saw with questions of integrity and questions on domain knowledge and the quest and and the values that have identified which are purely in white are values which have been asked generally now you would notice the values that have been asked generally are not specific and they are application based and because they are not specific and they are application based you should ideally study them in the context of dimensions or applications of ethics internet ethics bioethics military ethics international ethics and so on and so forth and this also solves the problem for us to hunt for values there are more than 20 values which are mentioned here these 20 values from the previous year papers can be recycled if the upsc asks later on identify 10 ethical values of a civil servant we'll just take 10 out of here if you just pick up the values that have been asked previously you would be able to answer questions that will come in the future see these are the core values which have been mentioned in the syllabus for example integrity so integrity will have certain synonymous values such as trustworthy it will have some application based values that if you are transparent then you have integrity if you are accountable for your actions then you have integrity if you are facing the truth in 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 adversity you have integrity similarly impartiality and non partisanship it means very similar to fairness and justice it again has a correlation with transparency and accountability these have been asked these have been asked and the core word has been asked similarly with objectivity if you have objectivity then your personal opinion cannot take a front seat and you will always do what is right no matter what the challenges are you'll be objective in the face of any pressure in the face of anything else that you are currently in the middle of and then you will also have dedication to public service now dedication to public service a service manifests in what form you have a commitment to what you do you will persevere and deliver no matter what the challenges are you will continue to grow and learn while you're in the service and you will try to innovate whatever is in front of you by implementing it in a more efficient manner in a more outreach manner in a more uh, acceptable manner very interestingly empathy has not been asked in any form the closest that we have seen is compassion but again tolerance and compassion as a core value has not been asked in the syllabus has been not been asked in the papers yet i expect empathy to be asked in 2022 tolerance and compassion could be used to answer a lot of other application based issues it could also be a larger value for social and cultural values but because it could also be slightly controversial because tolerance is a political issue nowadays it could be a different problem altogether so tolerance and compassion towards weaker sections again not asked yet but out of all of these out of all of these integrity empathy tolerance and compassion are values which are important not only for public services but for general humanity as well and they get applied for universality purposes the background is nolan committee nolan committee has these seven core values and these seven core values in some form or another fine overlap with the values of the syllabus selflessness integrity objectivity openness honesty and leadership leadership indirectly but the remainder six 
in some form or another are in the actual syllabus. So once you've understood this, you will therefore then be able to understand how do we map it. We study <clears throat> honesty and integrity from civil services, public services and the individual. We study objectivity, impartiality and non-partisanship only in the context of public services or civil services. Dedication to public service, we study only in the context of civil services or public services. Empathy, we study in the context of both. Tolerance and compassion, we study in the context of both. And therefore, we create a larger umbrella of values, which we will move to in lecture number three after this is over. Remember, and I'm repeating this again, public services means legislature, executive and judiciary. So how do you make all of them better? This is directly lifted from your paper to syllabus. You don't have to do anything extra for it. Civil services, how do you make them better? You have to do them extra because it is a part of paper four and civil services per se, apart from reforms is not really a part of your paper two syllabus, right? Now that we understand this, we now move to integrity and honesty. I'll give you a definition, I'll give you a quote, I'll give you an application and I'll give you enough examples to run your boat. The word integrity is evolved from the Latin word integer. This is something which is also having a mathematical implication. And if you know what integers are in mathematics, they are singular numbers, meaning whole or complete. It is defined as an undivided or unbroken completeness or a state of being complete or whole. Now, when integrity is used to define a person, when you're saying a person has integrity, what does that mean? It means the person is living by the values and principles that the person subscribes or prescribes to. In this particular sense, completeness is a comprehensive framework of beliefs, moral principles, ethics and standards. It is basically a worldview which guides every decision and action. So honesty therefore becomes a subset of integrity. If you are speaking the truth, you are honest. But if you are, if you are speaking the truth and committing murder, you may be an honest murderer, but you do not have integrity because you do not value life. So a murderer can never have integrity. A murderer can often have honesty. And by no means am I promoting or propagating honest murderers. I'll give you a few quotes. First, from ancient classical times, Conficuous, the strength of a nation derives from the integrity of the home. You can use this quote not only in integrity, but also in education and value systems that if there is integrity at home, there is integ integrity in the person, there, are in, there is integrity in members of the home, the family, the society, the community, the colony, and of course the nation as a matter of consequence. Then of course, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, real integrity is doing the right thing, knowing that nobody is going to know whether you did it or not. Integrity does not mean a public display of the truth. Integrity means doing things in a way, in a certain manner, only and only because you think it is right. For example, unless I am incredibly sure of the content that I have prepared, if it is not relevant, I will not deliver it. Just because I can get a few views, I can get uh, my hours counted, I can make some money out of it, no. If it is not relevant, if it is clickbait, so anybody who indulges in clickbait journalism, anybody who, in, who in, indulges, is, indulges in sensational journalism, does not have integrity. 
because while what you're saying in clickbait might be true you are still violating the ethos of the news then kennedy of course the american politician says integrity is the lifeblood of democracy and deceit is a poison in its veins if we do not have integrity in the way our democracy functions is chosen how it interacts how it discusses how it accommodates for opinion then what we have is essentially a death wish for example if we are not honest about the promises that we are making during an election and we are only saying things that make us get the votes and then people come to power and they don't deliver on the manifestos that they have sort of campaigned on you have made sure that the people do not have any trust in democracy anymore you have made sure that people don't find democracy to be a virtue worth fighting for there are 10 reasons as to why the urban population has a lower voting percentage than the rural population but the urban population also at a fundamental level does not vote and it is their fault is because they think voting is a futile exercise and the reason the urban population might often think voting is a futile exercise and a vote doesn't count they'd rather enjoy their holiday go to the hills and, and take a few days off is because of a lack of integrity in democracy so these are the three quotes now your introduction and your connecting points are ready let's look at the applications of the same the first component is integrity versus honesty right honesty is being truthful sincere and free of deceit you're just saying things as they are you're essentially stating facts integrity is a steadfast adherence to a strict moral or ethical code that there is a larger principle that you comply with and your actions are in correlation to that principle for example for example a child really wants to have a chocolate and the parents are disallowing the child from having the chocolate so the wallet or the purse of one of the parents is kept on the dining table and the child quickly takes a 10 rupee note goes to the nearest grocery store buys a chocolate relishes the chocolate and the child is a happy child but then the child realizes what the child has done is wrong comes to the parent and says listen i have stolen money i have taken money from your wallet without your permission and therefore the child is demonstrating honesty as opposed to for example all of you are either in college or would have finished college colleges have something called college festivals now college festivals are grand exercises where you have a lot of people coming in there's a lot of money that flows in from sponsorships as well so let us say you are a part of the sponsorship committee or the core committee of the festival of your college now you approached a sponsor the sponsor has given you an x amount of funds the funds have been deposited into the college's account and you're going to withdraw funds for implementing certain things for the festival now this does not mean that you will treat yourself to a pizza every day from sponsorship money or you will buy yourself a fancy phone from the sponsorship money or the core members are colluding because the general principle is that the sponsorship money has been given for a college festival not for improving the standard of life of the people implementing the college festival so that's the difference between honesty and integrity second honesty deals with words integrity deals with actions so for example when a journalist accurately reports events right when a journalist accurately reports events says guess what x has happened suppose a riot has happened now the riot may not have had a communal flavor to it and the journalist in his or her description of the event says we are not sure we cannot 
say for sure that there is a communal angle to this or there is a caste angle to the riots. The journalist is categorically putting it out there that the rationale or the reasons behind the riots are still not known. That is a matter of honest journalism. On the other hand, if the journalist compromises the news in a manner where it favours the advertisers of the news, it's a problem of integrity. Similarly, when an athlete is, is in a 200 meter, 500 meter, 400 meter relay, right? Couple of athletes are running and I can assure you, I will never be one of those athletes. Now, <clears throat> the athlete sees that another athlete while running has sprained and has therefore fallen down. Most likely that athlete is going to be me. And the other athlete then stops to pick me up. And the athlete who stops to pick me up would have won the race otherwise. But in the spirit of sportsmanship, which is a, which is a moral value, which is the moral principle, the athlete stops and helps me because I might be in immediate danger. I might immediately need some form of medical help. That's a question of integrity. Third, honesty does not imply that a person adheres to a moral code. For example, very recently there was uh, this uh, documentary sort of on Netflix, which is about the Delhi predator. It's called the, the butcher of Delhi, where a serial killer in Delhi, while committing murders and, and, and uh, dilapidating the bodies and, and, and placing them in front of the Tihar jail, used to keep writing letters to the Delhi police saying that I have done this and I have done this because I have a problem with the Delhi police and you are still not able to catch me. That person is being honest. But that person should not be treated as, as a pardoned person because you still kill somebody. And killing somebody is a larger moral problem. And that is what integrity implies. Integrity implies that a person adheres to a moral code. Like for example, some companies during work from home reduced the salaries of their employees even if they were tech companies and the business was booming during the pandemic. There is no reason for companies who boom during the pandemic to reduce the salaries of the employees just because they were working from home. In fact, the companies are also saving a lot of office expenses. That is a question of integrity. So a company who does not do that is a company which has integrity. And honesty does not necessarily mean integrity. But integrity was, but, but, but honesty. So if, if a person is honest, that does not necessarily mean the person has integrity. But if a person has integrity, you will always see an element of honesty. That's the basic difference. So, for example, now you have uh, food laws in the US. They, we don't have those laws in India yet. But we have those food laws in the US where fast food companies in the US, for example, a McDonald's, will have the exact ingredients and the calories with the burger that they are selling so that the people are aware that if you're eating a McDonald's burger, this is the exact consumption of calories that you're going to intake. Now, does that make a McDonald's an honest fast food company? Yes, but fast food is poison. You are still selling obesity, right? And US has one of the largest instances of obesity in the world. Just because you're telling people that a burger is going to cost you 500 calories doesn't make selling the burger okay. It doesn't make selling the burger justifiable. And, and that's the fundamental difference between honesty and integrity. So for example, when the pandemic was at its peak, most people didn't have a health insurance. For those limited people who did, a lot of their health insurance providers did not compensate for COVID hospitalizations. Saying a pandemic is, is an extraneous factor to your insurance contract. 
while your health insurance documents largely say that if you're admitted in the hospital for xyz reasons doesn't matter what the reasons are you would be compensated or you don't have to bear your hospitalization costs we'll take it from your insurance policy value but a lot of the private insurance health providers did not reimburse insurance claims for covid and the ones who did not they had a policy in place they implemented they implemented the policy but they should have so companies which did companies which extended it were definitely having a lot of integrity remember during the pandemic you saw a lot of advertisements of health insurance ideally companies should have kept health insurance premiums more affordable so that more people could take health insurance by simple economies of scale it would have still been a profitable venture for the health companies but that did not necessarily happen during covid health insurance and insurance health insurance including a covid package was exorbitant and that's the problem and that's the problem that we are referring to let's move on how does integrity play out for civil servants right now the very first five year plan identified the need for integrity it said integrity in public affairs and administration is essential and there must therefore be an insistence on it in every branch of public activity this is of course we've just become independent so all the branches of government no matter who they are must strictly adhere to principles of integrity this is a good way to contextualize integrity is a core value since the inception of this country post independence the larger question is why do we have a decline of integrity more specifically in the civil services historical reasons one we were under the british rule for about 100, about 150 to 100 odd years and the british administration was fundamentally not interested in the overall development of the country higher positions in british administration were reserved or were generally given to people who were britishers and the lower positions in british administration were given to indians because they required local manpower now people indians who were civil servants in the british era and occupied lower positions in the civil service naturally had lower salaries and had lower benefits given as compared to british civil servants as a result leading to a general cu- culture of corruption and especially in the context of the world war 2 where there was a scarcity of resources where there were uh, perks and pays and privileges which were cut down because resources become scarce when nations across the world fight this further added fuel to the fire when it came to corrupt practices the second reason for a decline of integrity in civil services is environmental now environmental here is not in the context of the environment in general but the general culture the last 20 30 years has fundamentally changed the way we look at things fast urbanization and industrialization have changed the determinants of happiness right of course power and money are the the north stars of of professional happiness and i understand why that would be the case but happiness also means a degree of contentment happiness also means a degree of peace happiness also means a degree of composure in whatever you are or also means good health a good family and so on and so forth but such fast paced activity often has an impact on what one wants from life and all of us at some point or the other in our lives have been victim to this we would be lying to ourselves if we haven't been right so in urbanization and in industrialization where wealth determines status and prestige and to attain wealth you might have to take the wrong cuts and the wrong decisions especially if you are in the civil services it would of course cause an environmental reason 
for example and let's understand this in isolation the salaries of civil servants in india plus the benefits and the perks may not give them the most plush of luxuries that there could be but they definitely give them a decent standard of living when the wants surpass the needs and the wants will surpass the needs because of the society that we live in because when we see our peers who are say doing different things than us in different mechanisms than us leading a better quote unquote quality of life it can lead to certain ramifications this is what this point is about and you must also understand while the salaries are not deeply low they are not commensurate to the rising inflation in the country for example take it from a different way take it from a completely different angle the punishments that are given like for example the indian penal code says you have to pay 5 let's say you've got to pay 500 rupees if you are damaging public property right 500 rupees was 5 lakh rupees in 1860 when the indian penal code was conceptualized 500 rupees to be a fine to be paid today is meaningless this is also one of the reasons why judges today prefer to give more jail than fines because the fines are not damaging enough the fines have not been negatively adjusted to inflation similarly the salaries of civil servants have not been positively adjusted to to inflation now i'm not talking about just the group a or the group b we're talking about civil services as a whole there are group c there are group d there is the constabulary there are the lower civil services and their salaries are abysmally low right then of course you have economic reasons which sort of emanate from environmental reasons so when the cost of living increases and your income doesn't increase it reduces the real income that you're getting for example 10000 rupees per month 20 years ago and today will not get you the same things will not get you the same quality of life and therefore there would be a problem and therefore there will also be a lack of a strong public will let's understand this through a simple example let us say now of course in urban cities in in urban corporations the rto is a computerized system and you can apply for your applications online so let's hypothetically assume that you have to go and get a driving license for yourself you go to the regional transport office in the district that you reside in and when you go there you see um a queue of about 100 people and somebody comes to you and says that i am on behalf of one of the officials at the rto and if you could give that person a certain sum of money a portion of it will go to the official at the rto <coughs> you would be able to skip a line and skip the tests and for the higher sum that you pay will basically get a license delivered to you like a swiggy delivery now at that moment of time you would think that if i don't do this you will have to spend about 5 to 6 hours of your day at the rto that means you would have worked for those 5 6 hours you would have not had to take a leave from work therefore your salary would have not been deducted so for you it therefore becomes a matter of convenience convenience in the sense that if i am able to get my work done and rather less painfully and it comes at a certain cost might as well get it done so that's the basics of the lack of a strong public will then you have complicated and cumbersome working procedures 
See, for example, when we see the regulations and the compliances in place for import or export of goods, taxation, compliances with taxation, a lot of times people pay money to get out of the compliances or sometimes the compliances are not complied for and therefore this creates opportunity for corruption and our fundamental laws that exist for corruption as I was explaining to you with the Indian Penal Code example are not sufficient enough. Today corruption manifests in multiple forms. It's not just about bribing somebody. There would be um, lobbying and, and illegitimate lobbying in one dimension could be looked at as a format of corruption, right? But you can't put a finger on it. We need more dedicated laws on insider trading, right? We need more dedicated laws for misuse of cryptocurrency. Though we've not recognized it as legal tender, that does not mean that people are not allowed to trade in, in cryptocurrency. So what happens if somebody is running a fake cryptocurrency trading company? What happens if a fashion influencer or recommends you to buy a cosmetic product and you have skin rashes after that? What happens if a finance influencer tells you to invest in mutual funds because the finance influencer is getting paid by that mutual fund to recommend that mutual fund and you suffer financial losses. Is the, is the medium at the fault? Is the influencer at fault? Is the mutual fund company at the fault? Are all of them at fault? So we need more updated laws. And of course, nexus has always been a problem for example, the collusion of industrial magnets. So big businessmen, dishonest merchants, suppliers and contractors, they would bribe the civil servants. And when they would bribe the civil servants, uh, they would want them to get undue favors done for them. And sometimes you might just share a profit with the bureaucracy, with the political class and so on and so forth. There are enough examples for this. We don't have to worry about it. So this is why integrity has been on a decline you could use this interchangeably for why does corruption exist and so on and so forth now how do we apply this in public service right now this is important a simple way to answer this question would be from a formulation implementation and evaluation perspective what most students do and I, I've noticed this in your ethics answers is when you're writing about examples you only give examples of the district of grassroots, which is largely the implementation stage. But civil servants or public service work in all the three stages of policy, which is formulation, implementation and evaluation. Now let's understand this. First, why? Integrity of the public sector or public integrity refers to the use of powers and resources entrusted to the public sector effectively and honestly for the public purposes. So as long as you're using the resource honestly and effectively for the right reasons, there is what is called public integrity. The OECD, which has done phenomenal work on administration and ethics, um, the Organization of Economic Cooperation uh, and Development, I think that's the full form, the consistent alignment of and the adherence to shared ethical values principles and norms for upholding and prioritizing the public interest over the private interests in the public sector. This is what is called by public service integrity. And the UN Convention Against Corruption, which also has done phenomenal work in terms of public administration and ethics, and also the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, which actually has a self-taught course on public administration and ethics. Anyways, um, they say it requires states to promote integrity, honesty and responsibility amongst its public officials in order to prevent corruption. If I remember, this is section 8 of the convention, a convention that India has ratified because of which we had changed our corruption laws to criminalize both the supply and the demand 
of um, corruption in the country, which basically means not only is it illegal to accept a bribe, it is also equally illegal to offer a bribe. Now, let's look at it from the three stages. First, policy formulation. How do we maintain integrity in public service at the formulation of policy stage? Evidence or data-driven policies as opposed to populism and disclosure of conflict of interest or donor obligations. There are actually two points here. First, evidence or data-driven policies. For example, let us say, we have decided to privatize the national airline of the country. We've sold it off. We've disinvested it. We have increased the foreign di di uh, direct investment in space, in defense, in insurance. Are we doing it for the right reasons? Do we have enough substantial, technical, scientific reasons for doing this? Or are we simply doing this to return the favours of those industrial magnates who have funded elections and bought political parties into power, right? So for example, let us say, uh, we're building more and more and more airports across the, across the country. Now let us say the city is here and you're building the airport here. Why are you building the airport here and not here? And when you're building the airport here, have you decided it for the right reasons? Because when you do that, then you're deciding this is environmentally sustainable, this is culturally sustainable, the populations are not going to be severely affected. Are these the right reasons to build an airport here and not an airport here? So your policies must always be driven by data. For example, <clears throat> there are often allegations of a large percentage of public funds on schemes which are spent on advertising, which are spent on promotions or creating awareness. Like for example, the Beti Bachao Beti Padao Andolan. Do we have data to support that by spending millions and millions on the promotion of Beti Bachao and Beti Padao is going to substantially increase the enrollment of of women in schools. That's what we are talking about. That is the reference that we're trying to make. Secondly, if there is something which is a conflict, for example, if you have been funded, if you have been, if your election campaigns have been supported, or if you have um, your rel relatives in a contract, your relatives are in the same space, or if a judge has some relatives in a different industry and that industry is in the court of a judge. Those conflicts of interest must be adequately disclosed and the decisions that you're making should always be free of those conflicts of interest. And that's one of the most difficult things to do. And there are enough controversial and political examples in place which are not appropriate to be discussed or even written in the exam. But you get the drift. Then we have policy implementation. Let's understand this. If X amount of money has been allocated for Y scheme, and it says it can only be used for the Y scheme. It should not be used for anything else. Right? So, <clears throat> unless allowed, you should use specific scheme finances for the same specific scheme, ensuring that the designated objectives are met. And the MG Narega, for example, to build necessary assets. For example, MG Narega is supposed to increase and improve the urban civic infrastructure. MG Narega is not supposed to make office gardens of collectorates better. MG Narega is not supposed to make um, beautification better. So using it for the right reasons. And of course, there is an ethical concern there that what if there is nothing else to do? Do you still not want to give them employment? So implementation. Then comes policy evaluation. Once you've implemented something, 
you've got to know whether it works properly or not. If you were to write your mains answers and you were to correct your own mains answers, all of you would get an all India rank one because you would not be objective. So true integrity lies. For example, you have implemented rural electrification or for example, you've implemented construction of toilets. You've implemented schemes to remove open defecation. Now the government has spent crores and crores on it and further resources depend on how efficient you have been with this. But if you are not following true data collection mechanisms, if you are under reporting or over reporting data, then you're compromising the entire policy landscape. For example, there have been issues of over reporting and under reporting COVID deaths in the country. For example, when this happens, when we don't know the exact estimate of people who have actually died from COVID, any of the benefits that the government wants to give people who have been severely affected by COVID can never be targeted and fulfilling. Two, let us say the government gave you about 10 crores to implement rural electrification in your district. You only needed 5 crores. So by the end of the financial year, you have to return the 5 crores back in your general policy discussion. This is called a March rush. Now, if you have to return the 5 crores back to the state treasury or to the central treasury, whatever the case might be, most likely next year you will not get the 5 crores because the government would think you don't need that much money. So will you oversell the costs that have been spent? Or will you spend the money on other things and show it as rural electrification? That's called data integrity, right? So this is how it gets applied in public service. You can use examples from legislatures and judiciary as well, but this is something that you should be able to answer more effectively. Now, let's move to the next part. Applying human integrity to general human actions, not just the civil services, because integrity is a sort of a universal value. Intellectual, personal, moral, family and professional, we've got enough headings to cover. In 150 words, you would not need anything more than this. So let's start. When we talk of intellectual integrity, pursuit of truth through self-discovery and examination, and standing up to one's own judgment. That is the meaning of intellectual integrity. That <clears throat> whatever your opinion on something is, it is because you have decided that opinion for yourself. Nobody else has clouded your judgment. You've listened to you, you, you've, you've listened to 10 people, you've, you've, you've spoken to five more, you've read five newspapers, but your opinion on whether the freebie system works or not is your opinion based on what you think is right. It's not blind faith or blind influence or, or anything else of that sort. So for example, several movies in India often fall in the lap of controversy your opinion on whether that movie was right or wrong, was justified or not, was, was insulting or not, should only be once you have watched that movie. A trailer cannot be a reason enough for you to do this. It should be based on why you think it makes sense. Right? Intellectual integrity. Second, personal integrity. A consistent set of principles after an analysis of volitions, commitments, actions and wants may not necessarily be universally moral. So what is personal integrity? Personal integrity means your moral compass over a longer period of time which is making sense to you. 
it may not make sense to a lot of other people but it does so your integrity as an individual may be completely different from somebody else's integrity as an individual they may work in two different ways right so for example if a news anchor despite the prospect of skyrocketing trps does not indulge in sensational journalism sticks to issues that matter does not pick up those mundane issues, those issues that keep coming up, which are more political in nature, which are more uh, clickbaity in nature, which are more uh, crass in nature. You may not get the kind of eyeballs that the other rival TV channel may get. You may not get the fan following that another news anchor may get. But it is your personal integrity. You're not crossing that line. Right? For example, if you are interviewing somebody who is working in pornography, right? There was an interview of a journalist who was, who was that, 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 that journalist was interviewing a very well-known person who's had a background in pornography. The kind of questions you would ask somebody who's had a background in pornography determines your personal integrity. There is a line that you will not cross. You will not ask questions which are demeaning to the person's background because work is work at the end of the day. Third is moral and, un and this is the most difficult form of integrity and unconditional support towards a moral principle. You may not have any personal integrity as an average, but you will have moral integrity. So moral integrity can exist without uh, personal integrity, but personal integrity cannot exist without moral integrity. If you don't have a degree of a personal moral value, you will never be this. But if you don't have a, 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 a moral integrity, you will never have personal integrity. That, that's always the case. For example, veganism. There are enough arguments for and against veganism. There are enough arguments on the environmental impacts of it. There are enough in, 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 uh, arguments supporting it the food cycle, the food chain arguments, and so on and so forth. But as somebody who believes in and practices veganism has absolute moral integrity. This may not be right. This may not be okay. This may not be the right thing to do for a lot of people. But for that person, this is it. For that person, this makes sense. This person might be a murderer. This person might, might have committed a 100 crore bank scam, but this person is a vegan. That's moral integrity. Then you have family integrity. See, at the family level, it refers to observable rational competencies and transactions, which contribute directly to a sense of meaning, purpose, and connection with others. What it basically means is correlative integrity. For example, suppose this is an arranged marriage and suppose A is getting married to B and this is an arranged marriage. Let us say A's family has a terrible medical history with heart disorders, lung disorders, alcoholism, drugs in the family and so on and so forth. It is the duty of A's family to inform B's family that this is what the baggage is. This is the baggage that A and A's family come with. And if they don't do that, they're violating what is called family integrity. It's correlative. It's a collective form of integrity. And then, of course, you have professional integrity. Professional integrity thus defines the professional who, consistency, who consistently and willingly practices within the guidelines of the mission of the profession or, or, or the, the guidelines of the profession. For example, if you're defending a murderer, you will still have to defend the person to the best of your ability. Now, from a moral point of view, from an individualistic point of view, that may not be a wise thing to do. 
but it is your duty as a lawyer to defend whoever the person is if you've taken up that case or if the case has been given to you you have to defend the person to the best of your ability that is called professional integrity for example if a dictator has had a heart attack and and requires an urgent bypass and you are the cardio surgeon the cardiothoracic surgeon on call and you're operating on the dictator with a heart attack you can't have your personal bias against the human rights violations of the dictator because the dictator at that moment is a patient in front of you in the operating theater you will have to treat him or her with the same care you owe the same duty of care no matter who the person is so that is what is called professional integrity other related examples would be say insider trading or leaking trade secrets or breach of client privacy right so these are applications of integrity in human actions right this is more than enough you will not need anything else than these two three slides as far as your paper is concerned let's move to the next part now if you get a question which has any of these values principled rectitude righteousness candor uprightness probity honorable you may not know the exact meanings of this and that's completely okay just interchange them with integrity you would be able to answer your question because this is a very complicated and a very cumbersome exercise to get into the technical details here and you don't need to that's the point that i'm trying to make now let's move to the next value objectivity impartiality and non partisanship they they sort of mean three different things i'll give you a definition and a quote for each of these and then we'll move to applications that's going to be the structure of the class anyway definition and quotes let's start with objectivity in its purest sense the idea of objectivity assumes that a truth in independent reality a truth in independent reality exists outside of any investigation or observation the truth or a reality has absolutely no two sides to it objectivity is a very scientific term for example the sun rises from the east for somebody who lives on earth is an objective truth will always be an objective truth this is called pure objectivity the two very interesting quotes that i found one of course is from abraham maslow says dispassionate objectivity is in itself a passion for the real and for the truth dispassionate objectivity in itself is a passion for the real and for the truth this means when you are examining the veracity of something when you are examining the contents of something when you are examining the nature of something it should be done in the most dispassionate manner in the sense that you should not be affected by it your personal bias should be miles away from it and for somebody who is able to do that it takes a lot of passion to be dispassionate i'll give you a personal example as a lawyer my forever love will always remain the law and every time i'm teaching polity as a subject i am this close to swaying away with the law but i have to be dispassionate with the law 
when teaching the law to civil service aspirants. Because this is not a law exam. This is a polity exam. Right? The needs of law for the civil services means exam versus the needs of law for a lawyer, for a law student at a law university are three different worlds altogether. So even if my favorite topic is X in law, but the UPSC doesn't ask my favorite topic, I will not teach that subject to the, to the, to the detail that I want to. You've got to be dispassionate about it for you to be passionate. Then is only when you can be objective that, okay, this is relevant, this needs to be taught, and this is going to be asked. So that's an example. For example, if somebody is conducting a research or a survey or is collecting data, you have to have absolute detachment from it. For example, let us say somebody is at a pharmaceutical company is running a drug trial. And while somebody at the pharmaceutical company is running a drug trial, let us say on Alzheimer's, and that somebody's father or mother suffers from Alzheimer's, and that person gets their father or mother to participate in the clinical trial and purposefully gives the father and mother the actual drug and not the placebo in the drug trial. You compromise the integrity of the drug trial. That is what is called objectivity. The second quote is, and this is a rather discouraging quote. Of course, George Orwell is known for his rather <clears throat> colorful views. The very concept of objective truth is fading out of the world. The very concept of objective truth is fading out of the world. Now, what is this supposed to mean? This is supposed to mean that as the world progresses to where it is today, it is very difficult to have an objective assessment of things. Scientific discoveries aside, but issues. You cannot objectively say this is the right opinion on anything anymore. That is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. So this is what is called objectivity. What is slightly different from objectivity is impartiality. The principle that decisions ought to be based on an objective criteria than on the basis of bias, prejudice or preferring through the benefit of one person over the other for improper reasons. So if, on, if, if objectivity is honesty, impartiality is integrity, a larger version. Sticking, sticking to a larger moral code. So it's a principle that says, whatever decisions you're going to take, they should always be on an objective criteria. The whole principle of integrity in formulation, evaluation and implementation. The same thing, but in a different context. And the quote is of course by pa Paulo Coelho, very well-known author, one of my personal favorites. We are very good lawyers for our own mistakes and we are very good judges of the mistakes of others. When it comes to mistakes that we've done, we'll have 100 justifications in the world. But when it comes to mistakes of others, we will somehow not take their circumstances into consideration and we'll quickly decide what they did was wrong. But for us, we'll always say that we were in the grey area, it's not necessarily completely wrong or not. So the difference between objectivity and impartiality is, objectivity is looking at things in a certain way. Impartiality is taking a decisions while looking at things in a certain way. And non-partisanship, which of course is mostly used in a political sense, is the refusal to condition accompaniment according to any political ideology or any political alignment or a refusal to support any side. Could be a refusal to support any stakeholder for that matter. And James Harvey Robinson, uh, for those of you who don't know who he is, he's, a, he's an American historian 
very famously known for integrating sociological research into historiography. He said, partisanship is our great curse. We too readily assume that everything has two sides and it is our duty to be on one side or the other. For example, when you ask your friends in a, in a, in a, in a common circle, what political party do you support? And if a friend of yours says, I don't support any political party or I don't have a political view, not having a political view is apparently worse than having, in your opinion, a wrong political view. Now, that is not something which should be okay. If you have the right to be political, you also have the right to be apolitical. And that is something that we must abide by and that is something that we must celebrate under all circumstances. So these are your definitions. Now that we understand our definitions, let's look at how can we implement them. The examples can be used interchangeably. Formulation, implementation and evaluation, I've given you a ton of examples. So let's start with policy formulation. Five examples, let's start with the first one. The genuine problem, you must understand this. When you are formulating a policy, a policy is nothing but problem solving. And if a policy is nothing but problem solving, the right problem must be solved. It should be a problem in the first place. It should be a problem that requires immediate attention and it should be a problem which is worth solving. Unless the answer to these three questions is not a yes, then you're fighting the wrong battle. So for example, food security is a legitimate problem. So everything that we can do to solve the problem of food security in the country, to improve the state of nutrition in the country should be done, must be done and to an extent is being done. But changing the names of roads in a country which has far more difficult problems to deal with is not a wise application of time, energy and resources. It might be a negligible amount of resources compared to spending money on food security. But time is also an equally important resource. And the solution that you're trying to figure out must also be objectively right. For example, it is a financial burden on governments to build airports, to maintain an airline, to, to run operations. So if you are privatizing airports, if you are giving third party contracts for management of airports, for most parts except air traffic control, which is government regulated, owned and operated, it makes sense. But if we have a problem of NGOs getting funded for the wrong reasons, by the wrong people, for the wrong purpose, and our answer to that is that they should have a bank account in Delhi for accepting any foreign funds by creating nothing but an administrative and a financial hassle. That may not necessarily be the right solution to the problem. And the reasons for why a problem is the right problem and the solution is the right solution should also be very objectively looked into. This is your classic debate between welfareism and populism. If you are delivering ration home, it makes sense. There might be some reasons why you would do so. That is definitely true. But if you're building an enormously tall statue and you're spending crores and crores on, on display of national symbols, does that necessarily make sense in a country deprived of resources to a large extent? There is a genuine debate. And at the stage of formulation of policy, there should absolutely be an absence of political patronage. For example, if you are recommending a policy, the committee is recommending a policy, the, bureauc the bureaucracy is recommending a policy, or a third party consultant is recommending a policy to the government, there should not be any quid pro quo, there should not be any give or take. 
So for example, civil servants who served to the best of their ability and, and have taken certain decisions because of which they've been made governors, not okay. But they've been made governors because they've worked so well irrespective of whoever was in power. And there are enough civil servants who continue to remain secretaries to central government ministries whether there is a change in government or not. Because the work takes over and is more precedently important than anything else. The advent of lobbying. For example, there are corporates, there are industrial houses, there are pressure groups, there are non-state actors. Let's take the case of the farm law issue. The problem with the farm law issue wasn't the goodness or the badness of the law. The problem was that it was not discussed in an inclusive manner. And because it was not discussed in an inclusive manner, it led to a lot of pushback. But was the pushback justified in the government scaling back the law? Must have been objective about it. Then we look at the policy implementation stage. When we look at the policy implementation stage, what do we understand? For example, MG Narega is a scheme which is applicable to a certain set of people who fulfill a certain criteria. Only those who are eligible to be recruited under MG Narega should be recruited under MG Narega. Similarly, suppose at a higher level, 3G, 4G spectrums have to be allocated. They should be allocated with some objective criteria in mind. Otherwise, we've seen the fallouts of it. We've seen the spectrum scam. We've seen the Colgate scam. Because it was not implemented in the most objective manner. And that's always the problem. So, genuine allotment of contracts, tenders and works as per the applicable process. No obliging elected representatives or executive while executive while, while implementing or executing programs. Again, the same point, but in a different manner. Like for example, ASHA recruitments. For example, Anganwari recruitments. The district administration is largely responsible for this. And the local politicians may pressurize the district administrations to take certain decisions on that matter. That's not justified. And that should never be justified. Similarly, when you are giving highway tenders out, now these are massive multi crore tenders. And because these are massive multi crore tenders, they should be given to the most appropriate bidder at the lowest cost who can guarantee timely completion in a qualitative manner. These are your only conditions. These are your only rules. And refraining from misspending out of public funds. Why is this important? Refraining from spending out of public funds is important because, for instance, you have an X amount of resources available to you at the state level, at the district level, or centrally. Those resources should only be used for official purposes unless authorized, unless needed. For example, using a government car for personal purposes when you are in an urban town. You don't need to. Similarly, no personal biases or acts of discrimination while reporting. For example, uh, this is applicable to law enforcement. So for example, if there has been a crime and that crime is symbolic of upper caste oppressing lower caste or a majority religion affecting a minority religion or an issue of, of gender abuse. No personal biases, your personal opinion on either of these three things should not matter. You might be a lower caste officer, but you will have to take it as seriously if the lower caste has killed an upper caste. You might be an upper caste officer and you'll have to take it as seriously if, if somebody in the upper caste has killed somebody in the lower caste. That's called objectivity. And then at finally at the policy evaluation stage, Again, maintaining the highest standards of collection of data. Two, once you have collected the data, you're very, very objective about analyzing it. 
for example despite having a law criminalizing manual scavenging there are still enough instances of the same to cause a concern it's somewhere we've gone wrong with data collection and third we must formally acknowledge that there are gaps that need rectification there are gaps that need to be solved for example the ministry of health and family welfare formally recognized formally in a press statement recognized that there are issues with private hospitals um, violating certain conditions or certain malpractices under the ayushman bharat uh, yojana where these private hospitals have been impaneled so what we must do under all circumstances no matter what the case might be is to deliver them is to take actions against them and to cancel their impanelments and they had the health and family welfare ministry cancelled the hospital licenses of more than 50 hospitals this is a proper report available on the ministry's website so this is the application of it as far as uh, objectivity is concerned now in the exam again you get words you can write them interchangeably fairness just justice equitableness candid unbiased non allied unallied unaided unprejudiced neutrality even handed more or less mean the same thing i understand neutrality is a favorite word in ethics papers but that's largely used in in the context of case studies and this takes care of objectivity impartiality and non partisanship right now dedication to public service again something which is very specific only and only to civil services let's look at the definition and the quotes a dedicated public servant is defined as someone who works honorably consciously and with pride you are working with integrity you are working with an element of conscience and you are proud of what you do this is very very important no matter what service you might be two quotes this was a quote that i have used fair enough public service is not just a way of life it is a way to live fully by lee h hamilton the second quote is talent is nothing without dedication and discipline and dedication and discipline is a talent itself dedication and discipline is a talent in itself ingredients of dedication let's understand what they are ingredients of dedication see dedication in itself is not a, a, a a composite quality in itself dedication is possible only if everything else sort of comes into place improving domain knowledge so the more you learn the better you are you're perseverant enough which is why you are dedicated you are looking at modules of innovation and creativity that is why you are you are you are looking to be innovative and creative because you're dedicated to the job and therefore you also attain a degree of responsibility which goes above the legal uh, sort of um, ecosystem of transparency and accountability accountability is what you are answerable for responsibility is what you want to answer what you think is 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 what you want to do we'll come to that in a while so this is your definition these are your ingredients let's look at it in some amount of detail with some amount of examples first improving domain knowledge and this specifically applies to all of you while you are preparing for this exam you are on this outstanding learning curve where every day you are learning something new and you are applying it and you are definitely becoming incredibly well read but the second you clear this exam your learning curve should also not stop while we understand that your training academies are built in certain ways where you're not negatively tested 
you are through the services you have a government job nobody is going to take that away from you but that does not mean that you will not learn more because to be an effective civil servant you've got to keep up with the times three very simple examples of it for example when you're a probationer upon recruitment you should not be complacent and instead you should work very hard to not only keep reading the newspapers but also attend your academic courses at your training academies do very well on your assignments and your examinations not only will it help you increase your interstate seniority later on it will also help you to sort of always learn more because what you are taught at the academies in terms of guest lectures in terms of a lot of things could be very relevant in your day to day life second for example you are somebody from uttar pradesh who's been allocated kerala cadre right now as somebody from uttar pradesh who's been allocated kerala cadre language is a constraint but it should not be a constraint that can't be solved you will not be able to be an incredibly efficient local administrator in kerala if you don't know the local language you've got to know malayalam to a reasonable degree for you to truly understand what's in front of you and to deal with officers who work in and around you who are from the state services and not only that also with general public as a whole and third for example your probation is over and you're an adm and you've been given the charge of land now land laws in the country vary from state to state they're incredibly complicated laws and they have to be studied in excruciating detail for you to implement those well because any discrepancy in a land decision can cost you a lot of damage in your career but for that you have to be very very well read on the local land laws of the country of the state of the procedures of the mechanisms and the personnel similarly perseverance the best example that you can quote in your exams is that the civil service preparation requires ultimate perseverance given the difficulty and the competition if you do not have perseverance it will be very difficult for you to clear this exam purely on the basis of intellect second for example another example while you can see that local populations are not okay with an industry being set up or a plant being set up or a highway being set up but you have to keep having multiple rounds of dialogue with them multiple consultations with them you have to convince them to a point where they have no choice but to be convinced and that can only happen through perseverance third as an administrator for example a collector you are a supervisor of functions in your district or your subdivision or or whatever the case might be while you may not actively be implementing a lot of things you will be in charge of a lot of people who would be working on grounds to implement a lot of things and therefore you will have to do a lot of follow up calls a lot of follow up meetings you will have to keep a check on what your teams are doing for them to produce the results that you want them to produce that is nothing but a question of perseverance for example let us say you are the the returning officer of a district of a district and the election is happening multiple sub teams would be working under you as the returning officer you will have a countless list of to dos that you would have allocated to different teams and different people to execute you will have to consistently keep following up on the progress of those with the team so that you know exactly what is happening and what is not happening then you have innovation innovation is the ability to do the same thing in a better manner creativity is the ability to figure out a new way of doing something new in a different manner so that's that's the basic difference let's take a few examples of innovation for example as a civil services aspirant you would use tables mnemonic techniques 
some of the other form of smart memory techniques note making to make your preparation easy similarly for example when you're using mg narega resources there was there was an administrator i was reading about in uttar pradesh a few years ago she used to employ mg narega resources to grow food in kitchen gardens and supply the same food to food crops to the cooks who used to prepare meals under midday meal this would generate sustainable employment be eco friendly and you would never have shortage of qualitative food that children were consuming as a part of the samagra shiksha abhiyan third for example at the district level you have to monitor the progress of a lot of schemes projects charges etc what if you could develop an app to capture progress reports of the same where your officer can go on the field actively take them into account input real time tracking and through a real time dashboard you can see the progress of specific projects in your district that is an innovation responsibility as i was telling you is you going beyond the legal expectations of your job for example as an election returning officer you are responsible for free and fair elections but you want to make sure that everybody who can vote should vote in the elections that are happening in your district then boss that is responsibility so for example working beyond late hours to conduct additional inspections of liquor shops to see if there is illicit liquor being sold in your district that is a matter of responsibility you are arranging for special public transport to make sure that voters in your district don't have the excuse of not being able to reach the polling booth where they are supposed to go vote so these are the ingredients of dedication fairly more than enough as far as your exam is concerned let's look at similar words so dedication perseverance innovation responsibility this is more than enough to build a larger cycle now empathy empathy is something that will apply to civil services public services as well as humanity let's understand the definition of it let's understand the quote let's understand the difference between empathy and sympathy and of course uh, its relationship with compassion definition empathy is the ability to comprehend another's emotion and re-experience them in oneself okay ability to comprehend another's emotion and re-experience them in oneself while i understand that you might think the word re-experience seems to be a fairly strong word you don't have to go through the exact same feeling but you know how it is to go through what the other person is going through that makes you empathetic meryl streep one of my most favorite actresses in the whole wide world said once the great gift of human beings the great gift of human beings is that we have the the power of empathy is that we have the power of empathy now let's understand the composition of it empathy means essentially the following things okay the ability to attune ourselves to others that's the meaning of it and it means four things one giving full attention to somebody i'll give you three examples of it detecting and interpreting non verbal cues acknowledging the perspective of others understanding another's felt experience if you are able to do for each of these four things then you are an empathetic person let's take the examples giving full attention to somebody you have topped the civil services exam you've topped your boards you've topped your college uh, you have a fantastic job in front of you but another friend of yours who comes from a very difficult and a modest background has not done very well and therefore is not having a job and is explaining to you the predicaments and what the person is going through you have to listen to every word that they're saying that's what empathy is 
For example, if you are heading the human resources of a company and annual appraisals and promotions were handed out and an employee came to you and said, I worked as hard as everybody else did. I worked as efficiently as everybody else did, but everybody else was promoted and I wasn't promoted. While you may have your reasons to not promote that person, you must always listen to that grievance with unquestionable attention. That's what makes you empathetic. As an administrator, for example, some local populations come to your office and explain to you that the doctors who are supposed to be deputed at the primary health care center are fairly absent and they're not there at the designated times. While you might think it is an issue which everybody knows, but you have to listen to them as patiently as possible. You cannot brush it off, you cannot come across as somebody who is not caring enough, right? For example, when judges are hearing arguments by lawyers, even if the case is a fairly futile case and there are enough judgments that have been delivered and the outcome of the case is almost predecided, the judge must patiently hear. Similarly, when opposition MPs or independent MPs are saying something in the parliament, government MPs must listen. When government MPs are listening, talking, opposition MPs must listen. The first rule of empathy is to be able to is to be able to listen to the other person. Okay, that's the first rule. Now let's move to the second one. Detecting and interpreting non-verbal cues. A lot of times, things are better said by not saying them. This is a classic example of it. For example, as a school teacher, you suddenly notice behavioral changes in a child. The child suddenly starts remaining very quiet, sits in a corner, was an active child but suddenly starts sitting very quietly, disassociates or distances herself or himself from the circle of friends. These are classic signs of child abuse and you must pay attention to those. For example, you are a university examiner who's taking a thesis interview, right? And you notice that a person is not very confident while delivering the thesis. You might be, con you, the person might be underconfident and that's okay. That is a characteristic trait and just because a person is underconfident doesn't make them any less intelligent. But what if a person is not very sure of what they've written? They don't have the sense of belief in what they've written. In that situation, you should be able to detect, detect whether there is an instance of plagiarism or not. Similarly, when a police officer who's investigating something is talking to a key witness, is talking to a primary accused, finds out, is able to determine that boss, there is a hesitancy, there is a, there's a degree of, 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 of stoppage in, in the person giving their views, might be the person has something to hide. Third, Acknowledging the perspective of others. Just because you're listening to the other person does not mean that you are, you may not agree with it, but you must acknowledge it to be a problem in the first place. You must acknowledge it to be an issue in the first place. So for example, a lot of times when children complain to parents that they have an academic stress or they have a personality stress or they have a peer stress, parents often don't take it as, as seriously as they should. They often take it very lightly that this is the course of life this is the nature of life if you don't have stress then you're not doing well and and so much stress is okay you can never quantify the stress that your child may have and that's something which is formidably missing in our educational system organizations for example like for example hedge funds for example investment banking lawyers police officers police stations um, schools colleges when you start appointing mental health experts counselors psychologists 
it's when you realize that these are places where people will have mental health problems and it is good for them to come and talk to somebody at work try to get some form of solutions fourth understanding another person's felt experience you again may not agree or disagree with it but you understand what that that has made the person go through for example when parents or guardians you know right they open up to children like for example if a child has had a heartbreak opens to opens up to the parent it says i've had a heartbreak the parent says i've had a heartbreak too so i know how it feels that is what is called understanding when senior officers are counseling younger officers for example you've just joined the civil services you're in the police services and it's the first riot that you've handled and you've seen blood and you've seen dead bodies and you've seen violence up close it's going to affect you at a fundamental level it's then when your senior officers immediate senior officers largely senior officers they will speak to you they will tell you how they they felt what they did how they were helped by their senior officers it may not work for you but the fact that the senior officers understand what you're going through is essentially what the fourth element is all about it's about empathy which is why you must also understand a distinct difference between empathy and sympathy right compassion is the outcome of empathy and sympathy and i'll come to that later for example empathy now we're discussing this in the non civil service systems this was in the civil service systems we're discussing now in the non civil service systems the ability to identify and understand another person's feeling and situations is empathy right for example an actor calling out nepotism or an actor supporting another actor for calling out nepotism because they've gone through the same thing whereas feelings of sorrow and pity for someone else's misfortune feelings of sorrow and pity for someone else's misfortune for example a friend of yours has lost her parent to old age your parents are fairly young your friend's parents are not so you may not at the moment understand what is it to lose a parent the loss of a parent is a very difficult one so you will have sympathy for your friend you cannot have empathy because you don't know what it is or you don't know how it is to lose a parent second can understand another situation cannot understand another situation let's understand the difference here for example you finished your residency you finished your M md in surgery you studied cardiothoracic surgery or you studied neurosurgery and you're ready to operate your hands are going to be trembling because a 1 mm error can cost someone's life and also your career a senior surgeon will understand that a senior surgeon will understand the nervousness of your hand shivering when you're performing your first surgery this is something you would relate to suppose you're in the government service and you are undergoing tremendous work pressure but your private sector friends will call up and tell you what is your problem are you losing your job no are you getting your salary on the first yes then what is your problem they don't understand the perils of the civil service go way beyond the stability of it similarly when your private sector friends are cribbing or 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 or, or they are in a state of absolute turmoil they call up and and you having a conversation with your batchmate now let's say you graduated out of college you got into the administrative services your batchmate is working at mckinsey your batchmate calls up and says terrible working hours no family time health is taking a hit then you're telling your batchmate what are you crying about aren't you making lakhs and lakhs every month 
So you do not understand what your private sector friend is going through and your private sector friend will not understand what you are going through. You will have sympathy for each other, but you will never have empathy for each other. Third, this largely emanates because similar experiences would have happened. So the DM will understand when the SDM says, boss, I'm having issues conducting MLA polls. But your colleagues, your friends will not understand the challenges of a startup founder. When I tell most people that I also make videos on YouTube and it's an incredibly challenging thing to do. It is very difficult to sustain, it's very difficult to uh, keep you know, good quality videos coming in. There's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of issues with online teaching and there's a lot of, it, it is a fairly stressful job. Most people don't understand it. Similarly, I will not understand a lot of your jobs. So, of course, similar experiences. Fourth, understanding and acceptance are evoked. Like, for example, in the riot that happened, you had to use force. The senior officer will understand why you did so and will back you up if the reasons are legitimate. And this is something which is far more difficult. You will have pity, you will have sorrow, you will have concern. For example, when in a family, <clears throat> their son or their husband dies in the line of duty, right? You will never understand what it is to lose a son or a daughter in the line of duty or a partner in a line of duty and so on and so forth. So you will have incredible sympathy for the family, you will feel enraged, you will feel bad. But losing somebody in the line of duty is one of the most difficult experiences to process and that is something I can explain to you from a personal example also so that's how it is so that's the difference between that that is the difference between empathy and sympathy now comes compassion now I've taken this flowchart this diagram from the Harvard Business Review from a project that they run called the potential project it says Pity is I feel sorry for you. Sympathy is I feel for you. Empathy is I feel with you. And compassion is I am here to help. Compassion is active action. So from less understanding to more understanding of a person's experience. From less willingness to more willingness. This is the table. You can actually draw it in your exams and you would be fairly okay with it. It's a very interesting chart that, that I came across and you should be fine with it. Clear? Understood? Good. So this takes care of sympathy, empathy and so on and so forth. Now, we move to the next part after we are done with sympathy and empathy and compassion. Now, our core value systems are over, the last part of it. I've researched and found some fantastic examples of civil servants, which you can quote in different examples in different values in your answers. I've taken them up from the newspapers, from Better India and so on and so forth, just running you through those. For example, Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram, uh, who's an IS officer of the Uttarakhand Kada. Uh, now, uh, he was originally from Tamil Nadu, so dedication of service, he really made work hard and, and he did excellent work in Uttarakhand. In Uttarakhand, what he primarily did was he has transformed the local economy of Uttarakhand, wherein projects worth more than 3000 crores, especially in the local produce, apples, etc. in Uttarakhand, are now very viable. Uh, forced migration from the hills have stopped. People are now living there and getting sustainable sources of income. Uh, Vikram Yadav, who's again an administrative services officer from the Haryana Kada, was able to uh, develop technology-related tools 
conduct uh, engagement and dialogue exercises with local populations and has been able to reduce 80% instances of stubble burning as compared to 2020. And this was able to be done without the excessive use of force. Guru Prasad Mahapatra, the IS of the Gujarat Kada, was, was working in the central government on deputation as the secretary for the Department of Promotion of Industry and Industrial and in Internal Trade. He was awarded the Padma Shri in 2021 posthumously. He lost his life. He was instrumental in providing oxygen and medication to several hospitals, therefore giving many a fighting chance. <coughs> he himself unfortunately died because of the pandemic, because of COVID. Rajendra Bhatt of the Rajasthan Kader, again an administrative officer, very popularly known Pilwara model, which was a multi-level community plan which reduced uh, COVID outbreak and COVID responses in the Bhilwara district, also replicated across different states and districts in the country. Dr. T. Arun um, Agmut Kada, he was posted as a collector in Pondicherry, if I'm not wrong. And uh, he essentially created what is called an online GI tagging sort of an app and a dead dashboard to revive lakes and water bodies in Pondicherry, could use this in innovation and creativity and other things as well. T. Bhublan, uh, again an IS of the Karnataka Kada, was able to end the pandemic because a lot of parents thought that they're going to die, so they wanted to marry off the children early, was able to reduce and rescue about 176 underage children from getting married in a year. Sriram Sambavisa Rao from the Administrative Services, Kerala Kada, was able to provide 1,500 homeless people uh, shelter and were transferred to safer places so that you were able to re reunite them with their families, were able to provide uh, enough uh, support for, for better social development. Apart from these, uh, just the last few, Shalini Agarwal, Gujarat Kader Administrative Services Officer, was able to come up with uh, an ingenious solution of setting up rainwater harvesting in 963 schools in the state uh, by installing low-cost, tech-enabled water harvesting systems in schools so there was no water shortage and you were able to ensure that at least 10 crore litres of water was saved every year. Adash Prasad, IS of the UP Kada, was able to revive, took the pandemic as an opportunity and revived a dying river in the Barabanki district, if I'm not wrong, and gave employment to about 800 people. Anupam Sharma, Forest Services, Madhya Pradesh Kader, was able to set up um, a biogas plant at an old age home by installing an oil pressure machine and a spice grinder to create employment for villagers while managing plastic waste generated efficiently. He, his uh, spouse assisted uh, in setting up the biogas plant because when tree saplings are planted, the, sap the saplings of the tree are planted with the poly bag. That creates a lot of poly, poly waste and they were able to manage it. Dharam Singh Meena, Forest Services, I'm not sure of the Kada, was able to revive about 66 Himalayan springs in Garhwal, provide sustainable water supply, which now give, wa gives water to more than 1 lakh people across 23 villages. Damodar Gautam uh, Sawang, IPS of the Andhra Pradesh Kada, very senior police officer, provided several text-based, technology-based police reforms which make SOS requests very easy. Sangram Singh Patil, IPS of the Telangana Kada, helped over 5,000 uh, tribals uh, from remote districts uh, by, by, by providing food security in police patrol, improving nutrition deficiency. So this covers your value systems with examples. We'll see you in the third lecture. I have completely and sort of fully recovered now. I, I am deeply apologetic for the delay, but I'm now working day and night to make sure your lectures are delivered uh, within the time frame. Thank you. See you.